ladies and gentlemen, and hopefully future Yaleys who are visiting for Bulldog Days. My name is Trevor McKay, and I'm the president of the William F. Buckley Jr. Program at Yale. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's event featuring Mr. James Bennett to speak on why journalism is falling apart and taking liberalism with it. Before I introduce Mr. Bennett, I'd like to say a few words about the Buckley Program. The William F. Buckley Jr. Program is the flagship program of the Buckley Institute, an organization dedicated to promoting intellectual diversity in open political discussion at Yale. We have hosted lectures, dinner seminars, firing line debates, and an annual conference every year since 2011. Our over 700 Buckley Fellows hold a wide range of political beliefs, but they all stand united against the formation of a liberal-only echo chamber on campus. By providing Yale students with a forum to engage meaningfully with serious conservative thought, the Buckley pro Program has become an institution on Yale's campus and a symbol for a more open and representative political atmosphere, especially at a university where the mission is the cultivation and creation of new knowledge. Buckley Fellows believe that all perspectives must be heard and examined in good faith. You can learn more about the program and how to become a fellow on our website at buckleyinstitute.com. I also want to emphasize the Buckley Program's commitment to freedom of speech. Disruption of an event is not consistent with Yale's policies on free expression as outlined in the Woodward Report. I would ask that each of you respect the right of our speaker to be heard and the right of your fellow audience members to listen to the event. Thank you for joining us and upholding the value of free speech at Yale. And now this afternoon's guest. James Bennett is the Economist Lexington columnist and a senior editor. Previously, he served as a year as a visiting senior editor at The Economist. He has also served as editorial page editor of the New York Times and editor-in-chief of The Atlantic. Before joining The Atlantic, he worked as a reporter at The Times in various roles, including Jerusalem bureau chief, magazine correspondent, White House correspondent, and Detroit bureau chief. Mr. Bennett resigned from The New York Times editorial page staff following the publication of Senator Tom Cotton's opinion piece calling for the use of military force to quell riots during the summer of 2020. Please join me in welcoming Mr. James Bennett back to Yale. Thank you, Trevor. Thanks very much. Th thank you very much, Trevor. Can you all hear me? Is this? Yeah. And, and thank you all very much for coming. I, I'm really appreciative that uh, you're here. It's a beautiful day out there um, to be wandering around or, or protesting something or something. So I'm, I'm grateful that you would come. Um, and this may sound better to those of you who are preparing to come to Yale than those of you who are sitting here anticipating finals pretty soon. But um, one of the wonderful things uh, about being a journalist, probably the greatest privilege of of being a journalist, in my view, is that you get to never stop being a student. Um, this ought to be true, really, of every profession. And to some degree, it probably is. But in journalism, it's really a professional obligation. When you're a reporter, um, the whole world is your classroom. And every subject or source you encounter um, can teach you something, often quite a lot. And you have license to ask just about everyone just about anything. One of the hardest things to learn, and I still struggle with this, is to ask the really basic questions, the questions that people call dumb questions, because nobody likes to look dumb. Um, uh, I've been thinking a lot lately. There was a great, uh, one of the great um, Times correspondents and an editor-in-chief of the Times named Joe Lelyville died a couple of months ago. And I've been thinking about him a lot. Um, he did two tours as a, as a foreign correspondent in South Africa and wrote a brilliant book called Move Your Shadow about apartheid. Which actually, reading that book at Yale was one reason I decided to try to become a journalist. Um, Joe used to tell young reporters at the time a story about when he was a reporter during the civil rights era and sort of getting his start. And he was sent down to um, a town in Mississippi, and he wound up um, interviewing a sheriff, a racist sheriff that a, uh, another Times reporter, a legendary reporter named Homer Biggert, had previously interviewed. And Joe spent a lot of time with this guy. And at the end of the interview, the sheriff sort of looked Joe up and down. And he said, he said, you seem like a pretty smart fellow. Not at all like that other guy from the Times. <laughs> that guy was an idiot. I had to tell him everything. And telling this 
story was one of Joe's ways of instructing reporters like me to be brave enough um, and you know smart enough too not to be, pretend to be smarter or more knowledgeable than we were never to go into a story assuming that we m knew much of anything at all an even more vital task for the reporter or the opinion columnist is to question what everyone around them accepts as true and settled to be the person wondering before the Iraq war you know, how strong is the evidence really that Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction? Or to be the person wondering in 2007, is the mortgage market really so safe? Or in 2016, to take seriously, as so few people did, a question like, how could Donald Trump actually win this thing? It's much harder than it sounds, and those examples are all illustrations of times when journalism really failed to live up to, to its role to scrutinize conventional wisdom. As George Orwell put it, to see what is in front of one's nose needs a constant struggle. And I've come to realize over my career as a reporter and editor, I certainly always haven't done a good job at this. And one of the areas where I've really fallen down is where it came to some of the values that matter most to me in civic life. Maybe out of a certain smug, smugness or lack of imagination, for many years I assumed that the classic liberal values, tolerance, free speech, universalism, inclusion, open-mindedness, were, weren't merely self-evident, but were self-sustaining and even sort of self-actualizing. That human experience had made them a kind of historic inevitability and that they, along with some form of democracy, some form of capitalism, were destined to spread throughout the world. I didn't really question that enough or think hard enough about liberalism's vulnerabilities or whether indeed you know, I and others were living up to the, to the basic commitments of the liberal project. It's been a shock to me to see those values not only successfully for now shrugged aside in countries like China and Russia, but to find them on the ropes here in the United States as well. And in my defense, I've been in very good company on this, I think. This view was shared basically by the Clinton, Bush, and Obama administrations. And in fairness to all of us, history gave these assumptions a huge push before most of you were born. But just as I was getting going in my own career, I graduated from here in 1988 in a period of great change, much like the period, not, not like, the like only in the sense that it will be great change, the period that you all are going to be graduating into. So right after I graduated, the Soviet Union collapsed. And then within a year or two, the first web browser appeared, and the internet began to become widely accessible. I think it'd be hard to overstate how huge an impact these two developments had. Liberalism, democracy, and capitalism had triumphed in a decades-long struggle against what seemed to be the only comparably powerful ideology and system in the world. And suddenly, a new means of sharing information and ideas appeared that se seemed capable of connecting everyone on the planet to everyone else. As Bill Clinton put it, um, and I covered the second term of the Clinton administration. He said back in 2000, there's no question China's been trying to crack down on the internet. Good luck. That's sort of like trying to nail jello to the wall. Um, it's turned out, of course, that so far China has been able to nail jello to the wall. And to strain the, the metaphor, some of our adversaries and even some of our fellow citizens have found ways to smear it in our faces, to confuse us, to provoke us, even to strike out at one another. I want to talk to you about how the liberal idea was routed in journalism, or thrown on defense in journalism, with what I think are devastating consequences for American civic life. There are versions of the story I'm going to tell that I think could be told from the vantage point of a university or a legislative office, even a corporation, but I am a journalist, have been one ever since I worked on the new journal here more than 35 years ago. And so that's the lens through which I've witnessed this cultural shift. But I also think maybe out of some professional narcissism that journalism is at the very center of this story. For a big, diverse democracy to succeed, for it to be truly inclusive, people need not only a right to speak, they need to be heard. We talk a lot about free speech these days, and we should. But I actually don't think that's really the problem. 
um, there are plenty of ways to speak up. The problem is with listening. And journalists are supposed to be the best listeners in society, better even than the therapists, I think. Um, but when journalists begin to believe it's not only necessary, but virtuous, virtuous to shut people up, to shut them out, then, then I think the country's really in trouble. For all its many failings, and we can, we can go into that, <laughs> particularly throughout the 20th century, journal journalism was really a bulwark of self-government in America, partly because it was grounded in these fundamental values. By being humble, or striving to be humble, God knows not always succeeding, about how little they knew, curious to learn as much as they could, and empathetic, not sympathetic, to people of all sorts. Journalists were supposed to provide the reliable facts and the wide-ranging debate that helped other citizens form their own views about public life. The journalist's role was to be a sworn witness. The reader's role was to be the judge and the jury. In recent years, many journalists have come to think that it's their role to be the judges themselves, to instruct rather than to form, to, rather than to inform, to tell people what they should think, rather than to help them think for themselves. Now, as Trevor mentioned, and you may have heard, I got myself involved in a bit of an upheaval a few years back when I was the opinion editor of the New York Times. It was the summer of 2020. And along with peaceful protests against the killing of George Floyd, there was rioting and looting in some cities. The opinion department, which I oversaw, published an op-ed by Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas, a Republican and a veteran, arguing that troops should be called out to stop the rioting in areas where police were overwhelmed. A majority of Americans at the time shared Cotton's view, according to the polls, though lots of people at the time disagreed with it, including me, by the way. Um, there was an uproar within the paper about the scores of journalists began declaring publicly on Twitter and elsewhere that the op-ed was not just beyond the boundaries of civilized discourse, but that it actually put them in physical danger. The publisher of the Times said he agreed with that view and he told me to resign, which I did. A lot's been written about that episode, including now by me. I think because it was one of the most intense collisions that we've seen, uh, between the old conventional ideas about journalism's standards and values and the new ascendant orthodoxy. Uh, don't worry, I, I'm not going to tell that story all over, the, over again. I'm happy to answer questions about it if anybody has them. What I want to do is explore the shift in journalistic culture that made it not just reasonable, but respectable for reporters to join in a chorus declaring that they were afraid of an idea. The Times, after all, is the paper that's provided, prided itself since the late 19th century on reporting without fear or favor. And so how was it that so much of the staff could embrace the idea that a mainstream argument was too scary to publish? A lot of this shift has to do with the new lib illiberal ideology that percolated for years on some college campuses and has swept out in the last decade to really take hold of the American left, at least the affluent, educated left. Listen, I want to be clear. I actually think Ill illiberalism is an even greater problem on the right right now than on the left. But for news organizations like the Times that historically leaned to the left, it's the influence of the left that mattered. How did some of these ideas so easily overwhelm the old conventional values of American journalism? It's not a story about some kind of political conspiracy. It's certainly not about malice or bad faith. It's just, it's about the cultural consequences of big technological change and the evolving commercial realities of the news business. These two forces have always defined for us what we think of as news in scare quotes. And I think that definition has changed more radically than we realize and is going to continue to change over your lifetimes. It's changed even in just a few years and with it so of the ways we conduct politics and even how we apprehend reality around us. The first newspaper to be published in the United States appeared in Boston on September 25th, 1690. It was called Public Appearances, Both Foreign and Domestic. The editor said the, appear the paper would appear just once a month unless, quote, any glut of occurrences happen. Imagine a world in which you couldn't imagine needing to publish a newspaper more than once to accommodate all the news. 
things moved at a different pace, and people didn't imagine there could be so many occurrences worthy of note. By the way, there was no second edition of that paper. Um, the governor and the council shut it down immediately because the editor said one of his goals was to expose liars in the community. Um, the notion then was that news was something providential served up by God or possibly Satan and also quite occasional. And that view basically endured for generations until in the 19th century the technology began to change rapidly. The Rotary Press came along. Was You were able to turn out many more papers printed on both sides much faster. So all of a sudden, there was much more space that needed to be filled. Then came radio. Then came television. And there was even more space, more need to come up with fresh news to replace the stuff that was ever more rapidly turning stale. More opportunity for supply, more ability to meet demand or possibly to great demand where it didn't exist. So where did all the news come from? Some of it came from sensationalism and fictionalization of reality. A lot of it came wonderfully from dispatching more reporters to more places in the world, covering subjects that had been ignored. And then the world also obliged by becoming ever more complicated and um, ever, ever busier. But the arrival of this new mass market for the consumption of news helped give rise to the idea of a new ideology in journalism, the ideal of objective of objectivity in reporting, um, because the business foundation of journalism began to change with the technology. Small printers in the 18th and 19th century made a living serving niche audiences, relatively small groups of subscribers with particular ideologies or points of view. The media landscape then was splintered. Big publishers and big broadcasters were relying instead on advertisers rather than subscribers principally for their business. And they had a, a big interest in reaching as many people as possible. To avoid alienating vast swaths of the market, it made sense to strive for a straighter just the facts presentation of reality as best reporters could discover and describe it. It was during this period in 1896 that a publisher from Tennessee named Adolph Ox gained control of the New York Times. Like some other publishers, Ox saw an opportunity to stand out by producing a more trustworthy, widely trustworthy kind of journalism. And he published an announcement in the Times promising under his leadership it would report the news impartially without fear of favor. He also said that he wanted the paper to be a forum for the consideration of all questions of public importance. And so, he continued, it would invite intelligent discussion from all shades of opinion. In other you know, it, once again, the broadest diversity, the widest representation of views would ensure the widest possible breadth of Americans would recognize their own point of view and feel included in the conversation. These sorts of ideas spread unevenly through the news business. And then after World War I, journalists, leaders in the industry, became aware of how sophisticated the government was becoming and propagandizing for itself. And the in industry began to professionalize. First professional body, the Society of Newspaper Editors, was formed in 1922. And its first principle was that news organizations owed it to readers to separate news and opinion. Over the following decades, opinion writing flourished in the United States. And so did news gathering. And the idea prevailed that these roles were both important but needed to be kept distinct in order for Americans to be able to trust the media to help them get at the truth. Then came the biggest shock to publishing and to the concept of news since the invention of the printing press itself. Many of you have not known life without the internet. Um, but even th for those of us who lived um, through its revival, arrival, it can be hard to realize how profound its consequences have been. I worry a lot when I start talking about this that I sound like an old guy growling at the kids to stay off his lawn. So let me say quickly that a lot of the, the consequences, including for journalism, have um, many of the consequences have been great. I'm dwelling on the ones that haven't been. And I, you know, I spent 15 years, as Trevor said, as a reporter at the Times in various roles. And I was gone for 10 as the editor of The Atlantic. And those 10 years were the period when the internet really disrupted journalism. And they were great years 
for us at the Atlantic. We were able to reach more people than we ever had before, hire more people, publish a wider range of voices and ideas, make the magazine a profitable business for the first time in memory. So when I returned to the Times in 2016 as opinion editor that I really began to confront some of the less po uh, pleasant consequences. I'll mention three of the biggest changes and then I'll come to their effects. The num number one change um, has been the wipeout of local journalism. This is not the subject of, of, of the focus of this talk, but it, it is a devastating um, reality that the country, I think, um, is struggling to cope with. In the last 20 years, the U.S. has lost a third of its newspapers and two-thirds of its newspaper journalists. That's 43,000 journalists that aren't reporting out there now. Last year, newspapers were closing at the rate of 2.5 a week, and new digital outlets are not filling this void. They're shutting down at the same rate that they're being created. Okay, number two is that social media has evolved into an extraordinarily powerful tool for policing and enforcing conformity of thought. My guess is a lot of you have had some experience with that. And then three is that the internet expanded really to infinity, the amount of news that could be printed every day. We've invented whole new categories of news to fill this giant sucking void. Call the first newspaper and how it aspired to cover the few events that could happen in the world each month. Now I feel like our attention is dominated by what you might call virtual events, things that happen on the internet, get reported by people who are reporting on the internet for other people who are consuming them on the internet. How much of what you read or watch on the internet is about stuff that's happening there rather than in the real world? Or maybe it started in the real world and takes on exaggerated significance in the virtual one. Memes or news, shocking tweets from famous people, or even someone you've never heard of can become what seems like important news, generating reams of coverage and commentary. And smart politicians like Donald Trump understand this and man manipulate it to their advantage. The success of his IPO of, of Truth Social in the market, I think, is maybe the most perfect crystallization to date of his mastery of how to of this virtual world. If you think about it, he's taking ownership, essentially, of the virtual events he creates. And as a result, he's created tremendous value out of all proportion, proportions to the actual real world values of this company. And he appears to be now con in, on a path to converting that virtual value into real wealth. It's, it's kind of a mind bond, um, I think, bending accomplishment. These changes all transform journalism. The wipeout of local news, in addition to depriving communities of, of, of a source of accountability for their leadership, destroyed the old training grounds for journalists, the places where they could report out in the real world and be held accountable themselves by the community for the accuracy, veracity of their work. Many of the new digital startups freely mix news and opinion in their reports because that's what the internet rewarded and still does, first with clicks, then as social media took over with more shares by people who agreed with the opinion that was expressed or wanted to express their contempt for it. The old as the old distinction between news and opinion began to break down, even established news organizations like the Times felt like they had to ape that approach to compete. And journalists also began developing their own big followings on social media. Best way to do that is to help lead one tribe or another in social media. Um, that made it not only harder for journalists to do the work of questioning groupthink, it began to turn them into enforcers of groupthink. Columnists at the Times, opinion columnists, are just some of the finest in the business. And they're certainly in the most privileged positions, among the most privileged positions in the business. But even they, in my own experience, could be reluctant to take on a particularly controversial subject or express a view that broke with received orthodoxy in a given tribe. As one opinion writer, I was trying to encourage this to do this one day, put it to me. He said, Twitter hates it. Um, and it's very true. Um, as these, at, at these startups and in public, uh, publishers like the Times, journalists spent more and more time covering virtual events or covering the world via 
the internet, they spent less time in the real world with notebooks in their hands talking to actual people. Again, this is me sounding like a very old man, but I've, I've come to believe that not all the old ideas are bad ideas. Real, and they include real reporting. Um, you know, sending a journalist from New York down to Mississippi, that can be really expensive, much cheaper, much easier to cover what's happening online. And the world online rewards that kind of, kind of work, or seems to, because very online people want to read about what's happening there. I'm not saying this stuff isn't all worth covering, but they've come to occupy too much of our attention and to mislead us about the real world, to distract and confuse us, even, I think, about what's real. Humans are so much more than the sum of their Instagram posts or their tweets or retweets. The internet leaves us with almost cartoonish stereotypes of groups we don't have personal experience with. During the campaign in 2016, I sent a Young Times opinion writer off to Pennsylvania to interview Trump supporters at some rally. rally. She, was, she was quite um, of the left herself. And to her great credit, she wanted to get a better understanding of, of a voter that she really had no personal experience with herself. Um, and when she returned, I asked her what, her, what she'd learned. I just remember this big smile on her face. And, and she was just astonished, she said, to discover how nice everybody was. <laughs> just didn't fit at all with the image that she developed of who these people were. And by the way, I heard exactly the same sentiment expressed just two weeks ago by, by another journalist. I mentioned Joe Lallyveld at the start of this talk. When he was editor, and I was a young reporter on the politics beat, he used to make us do a particular type of story that none of us really liked to do. We called them voices pieces. You were dispatched to a swing district in a swing state, like North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Michigan. And you were tasked with interviewing, I can't remember the number, but it was more than 20, a couple dozen voters with different backgrounds in politics. But you couldn't just stop on, on the street. You couldn't just interview them in diners. You had to knock on the doors in these different neighborhoods. And then, like a vampire, persuade them to invite you inside. And then spend like a half hour or an hour, and it could be longer than that, talking to them about their lives and how they form their political views. Um, and the result, when you sat down to write this story, it was often kind of dull because it was really complicated. There was no simple theme. You had a bunch of different quotes from a bunch of different people with um, different complexities in their lives that yielded you know, different shades of politics. Um, and it was only many years later when I became an editor myself that the penny dropped. And I realized Joe probably didn't care much about those stories at all. What he cared about was teaching us. He, he wanted us to have that experience. Um, and he was willing to invest the resources of the paper and its time in making that happen. Because if we were going to cover politics for him, he wanted to be under, we, sure we understood how nuanced and complicated each citizen's views can be and how sophisticated our fellow citizens were in forming their political choices, which is, I'll call it an insight. I'll flatter myself and call it an insight, but it's one that I've had reinforced over and over again over the years. So the New York Times almost went bankrupt during the financial crisis, came much, much closer than people realize. And the leadership felt the paper needed to take drastic action to, t to embrace the new digital reality. By the time I came back to the paper in 2016, a lot of my old colleagues were gone. And they'd been replaced by people who were considered digital natives because they'd come up after the print era with the new approach to reporting and so forth that I described a minute ago. Times did the same thing with their sales force, pushing out print sales people in place of digital ones. And they began hiring hundreds of engineers, coders. All of those moves were understandable. I think they were generally right. The mistake the leadership made, which is one that I think other institutions have made, was that they really stopped teaching, let alone insisting upon the, the institutional values that had served readers well for decades. They also stopped doing their in-house training just when it was most needed. When I joined the paper back in the 90s, you had to spend six months or a year on the metro desk out in the streets of New York reporting and learning the culture of the times. In the new reality is a lot of the hires went right into very senior roles, and now they were coming not from places like the Hartford Current or other local papers, but from places like the Huffington Post, which had different values, which were great for the Huffington Post, 
not really aligned with what the Times's had been over the years. And so the Times lost control of its culture. It always needs to be said, it still does great work. And some of its reporters show great courage. But the paper hasn't done a good job, I don't think, of informing its readers in recent years of what their fellow citizens believe and why they believe it, or showing them the true center and the true range and richness of American debate. As late as 2020, the then editor-in-chief of the Times said that the paper still didn't understand how Donald Trump got elected in 2016, which is kind of an extraordinary admission of being disconnected from the reality on the ground. But I've also come, as I referred to this at the beginning, to think that there's a further and harder truth that explains how the old classically liberal values of journalism became so fragile, so brittle. Um, possibly also on university campuses. The truth is that for many years, like some other news organizations, the Times had failed up to live up to its own stated liberal values. Consider the lineup of columnists when I arrived at the Times in 2016. There were about 11 of there were 11 of them, all individually great, really great, great journalists. But as a group, only one out of 11 columnists was a person of color. And in fact, the Times didn't hire a black columnist until 1993, and thereafter only ever employed one at a time. Out of 11 columnists in 2016, only two were women, right? How does that? Um, uh, and that year, 2016, there really wasn't a, column who were, a columnist who reflected the ascendant progressive um, wing of the Democratic Party, the, the, what was then really the Bernie Sanders wing of the party. And out of 11, there were only two conservatives, um, or two who identified as conservative. And with my colleagues, I tried to change all that. And I'm proud of the progress we made, diversifying the staff by identity, by skill set, by background, by ideology. Much of that work was applauded within the Times. But hiring conservatives, even just publishing conservatives, Reli even anti-Trump conservatives reliably created an uproar. I don't think that uproar was justified. That's not what I'm saying. But I do think some of the frustration behind it was totally reasonable. Where had this concern been for wide-ranging debate back when other people felt completely shut out of the conversation? Well, I'd say I, I, I think I understand that frustration. I still think it's a terrible mistake to give in to it. The paradox of the internet is that now, in the 21st century, it's returning us to the 19th century news environment, um, a splintered news media environment where you get to kind of choose your own adventure, um, pick, picking the niche journal that best conforms to your own view of the world. And you know, 10 million readers, in my view, is still a niche. The emphasis among news organizations on basing their business and subscribers rather than advertising reinforces this dynamic because the easiest way to convince somebody to subscribe and to get them to resubscribe is to reassure them that you see the world the way they do and not confront them with confounding realities or opinions. The problem is that now, as opposed to in the 19th century, thank goodness, we're a huge, diverse democracy with universal suffrage. And we need more than ever to be able to operate with a common set of, set of facts. We need more than ever to be able not just to speak f freely, but to listen to each other, to st understand why other Americans might not see the world quite the way we do, to understand why it is they see it the way they do. Journalism's proper role is to promote that kind of understanding, not to inhibit it. In closing, at long last, I'd like to propose a different view of how those ideas, or how the ideas of our fellow citizens can actually make us unsafe. Consider the Tom Cotton op-ed again. He didn't need, Tom Cotton didn't need to publish that argument in front of the readers of the New York Times. He could have picked up the phone and called Donald Trump. He had a very good relationship with the White House. Or he could have gone to Fox. I think it's to his credit, and I'm grateful to him for having published that piece with us instead. Um, he was willing to court a very big debate that can be dismissed as trolling. I think that that's unfair. I think um, that's the kind of engagement that the country actually needs. Um, and he did, in fact, start a very big debate. And despite the fears of my colleagues, no Times reporter got hurt. We published the piece. 
Nobody got hurt because of the peace. Um, and Cotton lost the debate. Certainly his proposal didn't move forward. And polling showed at the time that support for the idea actually dropped, at least among Democrats, after we published the piece. So if you believed his idea was dangerous, then publishing the piece actually made you safer. Um, and so, by the way, I feel the same way about the pieces published that advocated the abolition of police or the abolition of prisons. Um, uh, my Times colleagues did not object to those pieces, but many Americans considered those ideas to be extremely dangerous, and I think it was the right thing for readers to learn about them and consider the arguments. I'm not saying that any of these op-eds were the greatest of all time. Um, Tom Cotton's piece wasn't the best we published. It was also far from the worst. But I think it should now stand as a powerful example. It should have been a small example, now a powerful one of how liberal ideas put into action best serve society and how journalism can make that possible. Simply shouting down or ignoring people we disagree with is what, over the long term, will really make all of us unsafe. So thank you very much for hearing me out. Thank you. time for some questions. So if you have a question you'd like to ask, please raise your hand and either myself or my colleague will come to you. Oh, okay. Could I, could I briefly just, is that Fred Streeby, Fred? Fred, Fred um, I, I don't mean to associate you with me if this is going to create a problem for you, but Fred was the advisor to the New Journal when I was here and a phenomenal teacher of nonfiction writing. Um, hi, hi, I'm Kayla. Thank you so much for your talk. It was really insightful and incredible. Um, I was wondering, what is a prime example of this idea you were talking about of a piece of virtual news or a virtual event that you believe got too much coverage and sort of um, led to the idea of the news being sort of straight away from? Well, I think almost anything Donald Trump tweets <laughs> fits this um, definition, and and he understands that. You know, I mean, um, he will deliberately distract from something. There's a great example that John Bolton gives. I may be misremembering the details, but I think it was when it was discovered that um, Ivanka Trump had a wasn't obeying the protocols for, I, I shouldn't, I, there was something involving the family that was in the news that was actually a real world event. And Trump deliberately tweeted something outrageous while saying this will change the subject and distract everybody from that. And I think, you know, um, often, and he's, he's far from alone in this. I just think he's particularly good at it. Um, uh, I would make the argument that the whole Tom Cotton thing was an example of this. I mean, I guess that piece was published in print, so it was a real thing. But it was really an idea online that could be debated online. But it was, it was seen as having a force in the real world that it, 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 it just um, it didn't have. And then, again, I'm just a little hung up on Donald Trump's uh, success so far. Although the stock's plummeted. It's still, this company is still worth a couple billion dollars, even though its own independent auditor says there's real risk, it could go out of business quite soon. Um, and they projected like 150 million of revenue last year and made four. So that's, that's a, a completely built on emotions that are created in the virtual world and then um, made to have value expressed. You know, in a sense, you convert the value online via either the ballot box or the stock exchange um, or honestly, and this is, again, I'm, this is a bit after, but through advertising, and this is where I think publishers have played this game, um, because this is the danger of the advertising model. When you're trying to get a lot of clicks, you publish more outrageous stuff, and you can reach a, a wider audience and, and generate bigger traffic by exciting people. Thank you. 
Thank you for the wonderful speech. I'm Serena, and my question is, how has Elon Musk's acquisition of Twitter in his fight against wokeism affected journalism or the journalistic content on Twitter? I don't have a very good answer for you on that. I, a lot of people said they were going to quit Twitter because of that um, in outrage about what was happening and that Twitter was becoming a cesspool. I, by that, I, Twitter's been having some problems for quite a while. I, I've noticed a lot of them haven't actually quit. I think there has been, um, though, uh, I think in general, it's a healthy thing that people are beginning to divorce themselves a little bit more from those social platforms generally. Twitter in particular, which has always had an outsized hold on the media, um, the political community and the media community. So I think, I think it, it is, um, to some extent, attenuating um, the hold that Twitter's had on the tension of, of reporters, but still not to the degree I would like to see it, um, that hold broken. I used to think with my colleagues, I would say, you know, I'd, I, I, would, I would happily take the trade that they w could post on Twitter if they just wouldn't read Twitter. It was the reading Twitter that was the problem, you know. Posting could also be a problem, but the reading was a real problem. Uh, thanks so much for speaking here today. Um, a few weeks ago, NBC News decided to hire and then fire uh, RNC chairwoman Ronna McDaniel after backlash from on-air contributors. What do you generally think about what happened? Are you on the side of hiring her, firing her? And especially my question would be, how far is too far when we're including ideas in the marketplace? Yeah. That's a very weird example because it's an artifact of a weird thing TV does that nobody else really does, which is to pay people big retainers so that they'll always be available to appear on a round table. And I'm not a fan of that in the first place. What it does is it saves them a lot of time booking people. But if you think about it, it's a very paint-by-numbers approach to thinking about how you convene debate because what you're doing is picking a person that you will know will say exactly what you want them to say, right, each time, which to my mind is the opposite of kind of as an editor what you want, which is people who are going to surprise you and they're willing to be a little bit. So I'm, I'm, I, I'm sort of against that whole approach in principle. Um, in that case, I think it was, it was I don't I really, I, I, I think, what do I, I can understand um, it's an odd, th it's, it, it, I can understand the feeling of NBC, P of NBC staff who felt blindsided by this appointment, that somebody who, had, who basically apparently hadn't been, it was either an issue of judgment or integrity with her, right? She, 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 said, she turned around in this remarkable formulation, what was it? She basically said, well, I didn't really believe what I was saying, but sometimes you have to take one for the team. And to my mind, that's probably not quite going through the path of growth and learning that you might hope somebody would do before you would put the team uniform on them and say, go represent our network as a person of great judgment and integrity on air. So I was a little uncomfortable with it myself, and I can understand, I can understand that. But again, it's, it's a very, it's this weird thing TV does that I don't, I don't in principle, I'd love to see them um, move away from. Oh, and sorry, sorry, how far is too far? Impossible question. There is no rule, you know? I think there are where basic rules. You don't get to publish things that aren't true, or if you do, and it happens a lot, you have to correct that immediately. Um, uh, and, and you need to, I think the, the, the tougher standard is just intellectual honesty. Another old boss of mine, I just think it's such a great r rule, Charlie Peters, who was the editor of the Washington Monthly, and I was incredibly lucky to work for him. One of the, one of the things he said about writing was you have, to be, you have to be able to say the good thing about the bad guy and the bad thing about the good guy. And that we're losing, that's like, to my mind, one of the simplest, clearest expressions of how you kind of try to stay honest. Um, and I think we're losing that ability as the media becomes more and more partisan.
So at the beginning of your lecture, you talked about how capitalism is a key tenet of liberalism. And as I understand, um, like say the New York Times switching to a subscriber-based platform, that's evolving with the market. It's evolving to a post-2008 um, crisis uh, marketplace. And we look at, like you said earlier, that um, especially with social media, the people, the marketplace awards a new type of media. So if we see the media evolving in a capitalist marketplace with capitalist ideals just following the market providing for the niche or whether or not it's a niche or a widespread want that's there, how is it necessarily illiberal for the media to do this or should the media be separate from these liberal ideologies and or the, the capitalist liberal ideology and sort of work to promote um, the ideals to begin with? Yeah, that's a really excellent and penetrating question um, and that is a contradiction. Uh, um, on the, and I don't. If the Times wants to evolve in this direction, I don't gain. I don't. I don't. I don't. Um, I can't quarrel with um, following the market if that's. And this is, if it's what they need to do. What bothers me is the hypocrisy. Um, and if you're going to do that, you should be honest about what you're doing and not pretend that you are representing. Uh, a, a really wide range of opinion, and you really are representing, w to the best of your ability, reality without fear or favor. If in fact you're favoring the version of reality that, you know, a particular subset of consumers is interested in, and I think it's a deep problem for these organizations. The New York Times is publicly traded, right? So it's it's got an obligation to maximize shareholder value. On the other hand, it has this particular weird. Um, fact that the family still uh, has control and that's always served as a counterweight which is the roundabout way of reaching the point which is that if you are an organization like that that has established a civic purpose that to my view transcends your uh, market obligations then you ought to live up to it and I think that's what the country needs but we could be and 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 again it's, it's partly why I say no bad faith um, or malice in what's happened here, it's the incentives created by, by this system. Um, so, yeah. Hello. Yeah. You know, if I could, I'm sorry, I'm banging on too much, just, but just because, just to complete the thought, I work for a uh, UK based publication now, The Economist. Very lucky to work with these people. And the UK media ecology is very different because of the existence of the BBC. You can never create a state organization like that in the US now, I don't think. Um, and I have my concerns about that, uh, you know, for obvious reasons, for state censorship reasons. But it serves that, that media ecology very well. I'm sorry. Yeah, hi. Um, in your talk, you talked a little bit about how uh, the shift from paper to digital media uh, sometimes created sensationalized news, especially as you need to get a certain amount of clicks in order to have your media funded. Do you think that increasing state subsidies of the media would help like, uh, reduce this issue? And if so, do you think it would be worth it? Um, well, actually, I, 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 it, was, it was the shift to print, to big print, where we first got a lot of sensationalism in the 19th century was when we, you know, mass papers, but then also that's true with the internet. I just think, um, uh, I think the idea of more state sponsorship introduces a whole other set of dangers and questions that I, I'm not sure we're right now, bless you, um, in a position to grapple with. You know, I, I just I don't. I, it worries me more than it than than um, than it excites me that idea. Uh, and you know, I mentioned the, the 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 struggle at the local level. There are interesting experiments underway with nonprofit forms of journalism at the local level and at the national level also. There have been some successful nonprofits created. Um, they really haven't solved the problem yet either. So, but it's the least people are experimenting with all sorts of different methods. Hi, I'm Yen Jay. Um, I loved your piece in 1843, by the way, oh, that you were on. Thank you. Very topic. kind. Yeah, but my question is like, what would you say to those that believe your framework of journalism is a noble cause, but at the end of the day, ineffective? 
like uh, when you say that like people journalists should represent a wide range of ideas um, what do you like and yet like people still tend to like th find themselves drawn to their own set of beliefs and that will like lead to less people subscribing and thus less people actually seeing these wide ranges of beliefs like what are your thoughts that that framework will ultimately die off because of like a lack of belief in it I think that is what's happening and then maybe what's happening, and I just think that's too bad, and that's why I'm here, you know? Um, uh, and because I realized, and this is part of this whole liberal values thing, I finally realized these ideas don't fight for themselves, and if you really believe in them, you ought to stand up for them. Um, uh, um, uh, but, um, but I also think that actually, um, there's, there is an audience for that kind of work. And I think there's a way to communicate to people that uh, it says a good thing about them, that they're the kind of person that can, um, they're strong enough to encounter an idea they disagree with without um, feeling like it's an act of violence um, or uh, that they're not capable of debating it in return, I think. Um, and in fact, our own surveys of Times readers when I were there, was there said, showed that the audience said, oh, no, of course we want. Everybody in principle will say, we want this kind of thing. When you confront them with it, it's a little bit different. But you've gotten their agreement in principle. So if you're doing a good job communicating with our, your readers, which we were not, and they still are not, you're saying, well, hey, this is what you signed up for. You know, Be proud. And I think there's a way to do it. I really do think there's a way to do it, or I wouldn't. Um, I don't think it's completely naive. And if it is naive, um, then it's, it's still worth going down with the ship on this one, as far as I'm concerned. Hi, my name is Peter. I'm an alumnus of the Divinity School here at Yale. And thank you for your talk today. National Public Radio. <laughs> And a lot of what's the expose by a senior editor at National Public Radio seems to tie in with your talk today. I read he's been suspended now. Yeah. Um, and so it seemed like that was just a matter of time before something like that would happen. So just your thoughts about NPR, what's going on there, and Yuri Berliner. I, um, I've always been a fan of NPR. Um, I listen less than I used to just because I live in, I just I do listen less than I used to. And I, I can't say I have, um, uh, I, I, I don't think I, I can evaluate whether his piece is, was, how accurate and fair the piece was. Um, I do regret, I guess they said they suspended him because of, um, he had violated company policy by not seeking approval to publish elsewhere, which uh, so they've suspended him for five days from what I read today. I think it might have been a better look for them to say we're a big enough organization that, and in fact, this is evidence of how uh, interested we are in, in promoting dissent, that we can live with having one of our people do this brave thing. But. Yeah, well, I think that you, 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 that's a much simpler way of expressing the thought. I just, yeah, <laughs> I think so. Um, look, these are hard problems for any organization. And, you know, it's, it's tough. This, this um, you know, and, uh, th th these are hard. And in the end, like editorial decisions, uh, there are many, many factors, and, and, and everybody makes some of them wrong. Um, the important thing I, I just think, as I keep saying, is to be very clear about what your principles are every time, and then, yeah, um, with your staff and with your readers. I don't, I don't think that, and and the message can be to your staff: this is what we stand for, and it may not be a place you want to work for that reason. And that's a grown-up conversation. It doesn't have to be angry. It and then and then everybody feels like they're being treated, you know, in a in a reasonable way. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Elijah. And I guess I'm wondering, you kind of spoke about how, and I've seen this articulated um, many places, how 
um, how tech and the internet and digital media kind of ate journalism. Um, but one other thing that I've sort of heard percolating, and I don't really like grappling with this idea, but is this idea that news has kind of lost its primacy as a commodity in the American mind, and just like the ascendancy of news avoidance uh, among like um, just among readers and among consumers so I guess I'm curious whether you I don't know whether whether you buy that argument or whether you buy that explanation um, yeah um, explanation of well polling show I mean there have been surveys that show people are looking away from the news more and um, I uh, I I'm sorry about that. Um, again, to the point of capitalism and markets, it's their perfect right to do that, and um, and it's it can also be a psychological survival tactic in in a world that can seem um, that I think actually the news business is making to seem a little more um, uh, awful than it, than it necessarily is, uh, and. And I wonder if the news business will react to that maybe by by um, dialing it down a notch, you know. Um, uh, part of part of the effort to command people's attention in you know um, again online is is uh, is to be a little bit hyperbolic about everything. Um, our politicians do it, and our our news organizations do it, and. And maybe the market signal will help um, change that, I hope. It would be my hopeful take. Time for one final question. Awesome. There we go. Hi. So I've had fairly substantial contact with the work of a woman who I think you're probably familiar with named Barry Weiss. And one of the points that I've heard Miss Weiss make is that journalism is fundamentally in opposition to power and that its job is to create friction. And that perhaps to some degree, these like very large institutions like the Atlantic, like the Times, have created this contradiction by aligning them themselves with power. Do you think there's truth to that? And if so, how do you think we sort of rectify this? I hired Barry Weiss at the New York Times. Um, so yes, I am familiar with Barry Weiss. Oh. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's totally true. I, I worry sometimes that language, like we journalists, pa and I, God knows I just did it, you poor people, but we pat ourselves on the back too much and we get quite pompous about our role. So I'm a little uncomfortable with the speak truth to power kind of thing, which feels to me like that's what activists do and God bless them for doing that work. Journalists are not, um, we're oppositional and hopefully oppositional by nature and a lot of our work winds up being oppositional because politicians lie a lot of both parties. and. Um, so, so questioning power in that sense, as opposed to necessarily being oppositional, is our proper role. And I don't think we've done a very good job of it. I mean, I, I mentioned the Iraq war at the outset of these remarks. That's actually a really good example of, um, and, and uh, it's, a, it's a real danger um, for journalists to, to, cozy up, to cozy up to power. Um, and it happens in all sorts of ways. I'm not just talking about political power. Um, access journalism is a real problem, cozying up to your source just to be able to get the interview you want to get, all those sorts of things. And those aren't proper roles for journalists. And um, Barry is particularly skilled at, at, um, at, uh, at causing this kind of good trouble, I think, and, and biting the hand that feeds her when she, when she feels it's, it's merited. And with that, I encourage all of you who come back to Yale next semester to become Buckley Fellows and also to please join me in thanking Mr. Bennett for his time. Thank you guys. Thank, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you.